Hello everybody and welcome back to another edition of Ring Respect Radio right here on the Video Bros Network. My name is Bobby Munson and I'm joined by the man with the angelic voice. He is Papa Smokes. Sir, how you doing? I'm doing great, Munson. How are all my wrestling people doing out there? Hopefully everybody's doing well, staying healthy, and looking forward to coming out to some live wrestling action. Uh, as we record this one, Papa Smokes, we know that this Saturday we have live wrestling action of our own. Prairie Pro Wrestling presents Part 5, A New Beginning. And uh, last I checked, Papa Smokes, I think we are sold out or maybe a couple tickets left, and that's about it. Uh, if this happens to be up and running on YouTube prior to this Saturday, make sure to call any one of our sponsors. Uh, well, I know Wendell Clark's Bar and Grill sold out of their tickets, but Bar Tari Glitch Gets, if you still have an opportunity, call them, reserve your tickets, because there is no guarantee there will be spots left if you show up at the door that night. Uh, this is a really sought-after event, Pop Smokes. People were clamoring for Prairie Pro Wrestling's return. Well, I guess so, Munson. After the past year we've had with uh, COVID shutdowns and, and and all kinds of things in effect, we haven't been able to go to hardly any live events, including music and theater and all that kind of stuff, too. So all our wrestling fans have been dying to have a show. And we've been kind of waiting a little bit to put on uh, this comeback w, uh, PPW show for when we were sure that we could have a full crowd and have uh, our fans still be safe here. So it's been a long wait. It's been damn near two years, and uh, I feel the same way. I can't get, can't wait to get back to live wrestling action. Yeah, it's going to be excellent. Looking forward to seeing all of you that are going to be able to make it out there. Out there, uh, for those of you who won't be able to join us live and in person, don't worry. We've got you covered. As always, your video bros right here will be behind the cameras, making sure that every bit of the action is taped, recorded, and ready for YouTube down the road. So you will get your opportunity to check out the Prairie Pro Wrestling Part 5, A New Beginning, when we release it on YouTube. In the meantime, though... If you want to get caught up on previous matches from Prairie Pro Wrestling, we have those all up and on YouTube. And just dropped another set of four matches from our championship tournament that were taped back in March 2020 before the shutdown. Those matches doing really well. Very uh, popular and very receptive on YouTube. A lot of people checking those out. So if you haven't done so already, check them out there. And before we get started with the show today, we're going to ask you to go ahead and click the subscribe button down below if you haven't done so already. Hit the notification bell so you know anytime we release new material right here on the Video Bros Network. Also, we want to get you to check out our good friends at Backbreaker Media. Backbreaker Media have been a very good supporter and sponsor of Ring Respect Radio. So check them out on all different media outlets. And our good friends at the Canadian Wrestling Network as well, too. Papa Smokes, it's time. We get back to some reviews and recaps. Uh, we had to call some matches last week, so we missed out on MLW Fusion Alpha episode four. So we're going to give them four and five here on one edition of Ring Respect Radio. So we're going to start with MLW Fusion Alpha episode number four. And we, they kicked this one off in high gear, I'd have to say, Pop Smoke. So this one started off with a match in the ring right away. We're getting two guys that are scheduled to be in the Opera Cup tournament, but this was not one of the opening matches of the Opera Cup. We're getting to see the MLW debut of Lee Moriarty as he's taking on heavyweight hustle, Calvin Tankman. Now, I gotta say, before we even get into the match itself, I had a bit of a bit of an issue here because Lee Moriarty, I've seen, has now gone over to AEW, and I watch the occasional match with AEW. I find it hard to watch any full programming from them, as you would know. Two Papa Smokes, uh, neither one of us can sit down and watch a full show. So I haven't really seen much from Liam Moriarty. I just knew a lot of AEW fans were ranting and raving about him. So maybe I was uh, not sure what I was going to expect from this guy if we were going to see a bunch of, you know, false finishes and move after move of just things that shouldn't really be able to have a guy get back up from. But this was not that. And this was a lot better than that. I have to say I really enjoyed what Lee Moriarty brought to the table, at least in MLW. Uh, but it also helped that he was in against uh, Calvin Tankman, who I think has done great work in MLW and has been fantastic. Uh, what are your thoughts, uh, especially on Lee Moriarty making his debut? I had a similar feeling about Lee Moriarty. I had heard and read some stuff online about him. Same thing, that he was uh, highly touted as a new guy in AEW, but uh, I hadn't really seen much of his stuff yet. I have to start off by saying what an extremely weird intro and and 
walk to the ring, he had uh, he had that mask on and he had his headphones on and he was kind of dancing, but it kind of seemed like he was taken over by a set of spasms as well. And once he got into the ring, it's he kind of had a thing going on where it seemed like whatever was coming through his earphones was kind of scaring him or discombobulating him. I don't know what that whole thing is all about, but it struck me as weird. At least it's a, it's a unique entrance, but uh, Lee Moriarty, I thought, looked pretty good in this match. Uh, you can see he's, he's fully embraced the uh, new style of wrestling, if you want to call it that. Uh, he, he uses a lot of high spots. He uses a lot of aerial maneuvers and stuff like that, but this match was still laid out pretty nicely. It was the classic... Uh, smaller guy against the bigger stronger guy and and i thought they set this match up pretty well with some back and forth between the two and a lot more aggression out of kelvin tankman than what we saw prior to the i guess the end of last season with mlw i found that in this match they were showing kelvin tankman as a much more aggressive guy maybe not in the opening few minutes of the matchup they kind of had it where he was thrown off by the young guy the new guy kind of taking him a little bit by surprise and i i say young and new but kelvin tankman himself isn't old or anything like that you just been in the company a little bit longer and uh you know the great thing about this one too i think these guys know each other really well we know from uh pbw uwfi which our good buddy robert martyrs talked highly about and sent us matches from but both lee moriarty and calvin tankman came from there and have worked together before so you could really sense the uh how comfortable they were working with each other in this particular matchup uh there was some uh Great spots. Uh, as you said, yeah, Lee Moriarty definitely has embraced what, you know, a lot of people like about the modern day wrestling. And I think that's why a lot of the AEW fans are ranting and raving about this young guy. I think that uh, a lot can be said about how much more grounded I'm pretty sure that he was here than he would be over there. I guess I'd have to go check that out to really get a true view of that for myself. But I just feel like working with Tankman in this environment and MLW worked really well. Uh, a great match from the two of them. Calvin getting the big win here. But again, not making Lee look bad. Lee really put up a fight, and both of them look strong going into their first round matchups of the Opera Cup tournament. And this could even be a preview of our finale of the Opera Cup. Yeah, for sure. And uh, the commentators throughout the match told us a little bit about Lee Moriarty, including his particular style, which he calls Taiga style. You remember the Wu-Tang albums, Munson, with that Taiga style? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, it's kind of like a, a fusion between uh, martial arts styles and professional wrestling styles, which he's uh, he's made to uh, fit his own uh, in-ring style. So uh, that's kind of neat. It's a good thing. Um, yeah, this match was pretty okay, I thought. Uh, neither, uh, neither wrestler in this ended up looking weaker after it. Moriarty still looked good after that loss. There's a couple of nice big spots in this. Do you remember when they were fighting outside the ring and uh, and Tankman uh, Tankman gave him uh, Moriarty a power bomb onto the ring apron? That was a nice spot. And then there was a part two where Tankman was leaning was on his knees leaning through the ropes and he ended up power slamming Moriarty on the apron as well. That was a very unique and creative spot as well. So. And the other part I liked was the finish, the Tankman driver, the way uh, Calvin just completely overpowered uh, Lee Moriarty and uh, got him up into that suplex kind of vertical suplex position and, and then into the driver. And wow, that just looked fantastic. And uh, crowd really popped for the for the ending of this match and Tankman looking awesome. That's the kind of win that he needed to look convincing going into the first round of the Opera Cup. Yeah, and it seems like the as things are starting to unfold, and we'll get into it more, it seems like there's a lot of story being built around Tankman and the Opera Cup here. So it And it starts with the aftermath of this particular match. So King Mo and Alex Kane came down to the ring apron. Uh, they're standing there being uh, uh, being interviewed by Alicia Toot. Uh, they're taking a look at Calvin Tankman. Uh, King Mo looking like he's uh, looking to recruit more to come over to his side. Uh, at but we also have to keep in mind that Alex Kane was actually named as a standby in the Opera Cup tournament. So as much as it seems like they could be scouting Tankman, they could also be scouting for taking somebody out closer towards the final, allowing Alex Kane an easy way in towards, say, the semifinal or the final of the Opera Cup tournament itself. Well, that's an interesting theory, Munson. I wonder if there's anything to that, too, because... 
you notice MLW has never really uh, named anybody that's a that's a extra or a standby backup in the Opera Cup. So th perhaps this has some meaning to the ultimate storyline. I like your theory. We'll have to see if that comes true. For sure. Uh, moving on from there, we had a promo from everybody's favorite promo maker, Joseph Samael. And man, did I like this one a lot. I mean, like them all a lot, but two leg or two belts, one leg. That's what he referred to Hammerstone. He said they took the ultimate prize despite fought to losing the MLW World Heavyweight Champion. They destroyed Hammerstone is the key point, focal point here. And the challenge is laid down. They want the War Chamber match. Joseph Samael wants Contra versus Hammerstone and whoever he can muster up at the War Chamber. Thoughts on this one? Well, I liked this a lot. I love all of Joseph Samael's work on the microphone. And again, this was another one where he has some poetic, apocalyptic sounding stuff. I like the way he referred to Contra. He says, cut off one head and two grow back. And it's just such a great uh, mythological image of the Hydra. You know, you can you can battle it. Uh, you can have the hero Perseus battle it, but every time he cuts off one head, two grow back. So it's the it's the ever ever present monster that is Contra Unit, and Samael just sells this stuff so great. He really does. Uh, so going on from there, uh, heading to backstage to another uh, bit of a promo here. Uh, we're in. Uh, Cesar Duran's office, Hammerstone comes walking in, holding both championship belts. And we've been asking ourselves, what would happen once the two belts were around one guy? Would they continue on as a double champion? Would a belt get relinquished? What was going to be the outcome? And here was our answer. Hammerstone comes in. He makes a mention that the uh, winning of the uh, National Openweight Championship was the greatest moment in his entire career until he won the MLW World Heavyweight Champion. Hammerstone knows that the National Openweight Championship deserves to have somebody that competitively can defend it and carry on the legacy of it that he started. And he hands back the title to Cesar Duran. But Cesar Duran also then puts it back on Hammerstone that the challenge has been laid down by Contra for the War Chamber. It's time to start finding a team. Yeah, and well, one thing I wanted to say right off the bat, Munson, is just how weird Cesar Duran's office looks. With those weird lights and the punching bag and the couch and the pinups all over the wall, it kind of looks like a teenage boy's bedroom. But other than that, I'm not going to go on about his office. But uh, uh, yeah, an interesting uh, conversation between Hammerstone and Duran. Again, we see that kind of slippery, heelish nature. We're not sure if he's a complete heel because he's kind of making some concessions towards the baby face as well. It's just all the mystery that is Caesar Durant. We don't know who he is. We don't know what he's up to exactly yet. But we have our suspicions that he's on the dark side. Yeah, and his, uh, bringing up his office is a good point. It's uh, very reminiscent of the same image that his office, office had when he was over in Lucha Underground as well, too. So it seems like they've brought that element over as well. So again, some of that Lucha Underground stuff is coming over into MLW. But as we were talking before this went on the air... Things are starting to unfold and work, and it seems to be that some of the aspects that really did work with Lucha Underground are the points that Court Bauer and MLW have taken and put together in such a beautiful way, and it's it's working out quite nicely. Uh, so from there, after this particular uh, backstage segment, we went to Alicia Toot, who has a special exclusive feature on the scandals with Cesar Duran. She's got footage of his last night in Boyle Heights. And then also footage of a mis uh, woman who is in the office and stuff like that. Who is she, Papa Smokes? Let's see. Uh, do you have any any inclination as to who it could have been? Well, I I just assumed that it was Selena De La Renta when they were having their problems before. We knew that this the at that time the mysterious El Jefe before we knew it was Cesar Duran uh, that he had something on. De La Renta, and she was uh, concerned and upset about this. So when we saw this uh, woman looking through his office searching for something, I I got the feeling that that was Selena De La Renta trying to find whatever it is that Duran holds over her. But uh, we never get a good look at, at who she is, so I guess we're left to speculate for now. But an interesting expose put up there by Alicia, too, and... Uh, uh, really, like making Duran look quite guilty of a lot of uh, crimes, uh, 
not only against wrestling, but uh, criminal crimes as well. They talk that he was, uh, he's aligned with some of the cartels and, and other mo money laundering and other kinds of criminal activities and uh, fraud and extortion and stuff like that. So I, I guess we're going to see uh, what happens from this, but uh, it makes me fear for Alicia too, uh, making this uh, damning expose about her boss right now. And uh, we'll have to see where this goes. And it makes you wonder, okay, now the woman in the video, Selena De Laurento is kind of where my mind had gone to from this whole thing. It makes you wonder, is this the last we ever saw of her? They made it believe that at the end of last season, this was the last we'd ever see of her. And again, I'm starting to question if that's the case. Maybe it was her herself that leaked out this footage and this information to her supposed frenemy, Alicia, too. There is very much that possibility. Alicia had to have got her story from somewhere. Somebody had to be leaking something, and maybe that was who it was. But yeah, definitely a great segment. Uh, really starts to paint a bigger picture of Cesar Duran. Uh, so we'll see how that starts to unfold in the coming weeks. Uh, next, we had a uh, promo done by Tom Lawler talking about Davey Richards. The two of them going to be taking uh, on each other in the main event. Round one of the Opera Cup. Uh, is there anything more to say than this is exactly what it needed to be? Tom Lawler is well spoken. Uh, this matchup is going to be a great first round matchup in the Opera Cup as well, too. Um, I, I liked it I, exactly what it needed to be. It was short to the point and everything that needed to be said got said in this little bit of time. Yeah, completely agreed. It's uh, setting up for our main event tonight and uh, well done by Lawler. For sure. So finally, back to in-ring action after that. It's the featherweight division, which we've had a look in uh, previously on MLW Fusion Alpha. This week, we're getting Brittany Blake taking on the other half of the C-Stars, Delma, Delmi Exo. Uh, this one, Papa Smokes, I'd have to say I was not sure what to think when I coming into it, but uh, Brittany Blake has a good look. I think she's got some uh, decent skill. I think that there is going to be some good stuff out of her. I think I was even more impressed with Delmi Exo, actually. It's a lot more uh, incredible wrestling that I saw out of her. Some nice uh, different wrestling holds. And also, you know, like they, she had that nice snap fisherman suplex in there and stuff, too. There was some really, really, really good wrestling from Delmi Exo. And having no preconceived notion of her work from prior to this matchup, I like what I saw. Yeah, I, I like what I saw too. I wasn't totally crazy about this match, and I think it might have been because I thought that Brittany Blake looked okay, but she looks still pretty green in the ring, I thought. Um, I was kind of torn. She, she she has a nice slower style. She's, she's not too busy. She's not... Uh, frantically running around trying to remember her spots trying to get everything in like she looks cool and collected and yet her style seems to lack a certain something where it just some of her strikes and some of her moves looked like she was kind of just dialing it in or going through the motions a little bit I don't know but uh, I'm, I'm I'm not trying to criticize her negatively completely like that but uh, again I think this uh, featherweight division is a work in progress. I think these uh, ladies will get more comfortable with the whole thing as it goes along. But tell me, Exo, yeah, I have to agree with you there. She's looking good. Also a big, strong, athletic girl. That that That's part of it, too. She looked very convincing as a lady wrestler, not one of these little petite models like they have in a lot of companies these days. She's a big, strong, strapping girl, and uh, she's very athletic and can do all her moves. So out of this match, the main thing I took was that uh, Del Miexo looking really good and uh, for the future. That's kind of where I was at too. And I uh, again, I didn't want to say too much on the uh, negative side or anything like that. Uh, again, Brittany Blake's got time. But, uh, you know, I think the thing that surprised me the most is that when I was looking into all these different uh, women that are going to be partaking in the featherweight division, and it seemed to me like Brittany Blake had the most time in the industry. So she had the most experience overall from any of them. But yet, so far out of everybody that we've been introduced to uh, up until this point, and also with the uh, next episode that we'll talk about in a little bit, she actually seems to be, like, to me, looking like the most green in there, like you were mentioning, too. Again, it could be a com an issue with comfortability. Uh, this, again, having worked where she's worked, she hasn't been in front of that size of audience or in front of a television audience at this point. It could be some of those early jitters, or maybe... 
the chemistry just isn't there with Delmi Exo in a one-on-one -on -one competition. So we'll have to see as Brittany Blake unfolds with some of the other women in the division how it goes about. But we want to speak about uh, strong, strapping women that are being pushed to the moon right now in the featherweight division. Backstage, an interview with Willow Nightingale. Man, is she being heavily featured every single week right now. And I'm not against it. She's got charisma. She was good inside the ring in her debut matchup. I think that they're making the right move, taking a taking a gamble, pushing Willow Nightingale. Have to agree there, too. Uh, uh, she's got the entire package for what they're looking for, for maybe the first ladies champion, someone to uh, represent. <clears throat> excuse me, the new featherweight title and all that. Um, she she has a good look. She has a strong look. Uh, she's strong in the ring. She has a nice smile. She's a perfect baby face. So I think uh, this is a good choice. Uh, she's also quite well-spoken, as we'll find out on the next episode as well. But uh, I think she has all the pieces to be a popular ladies uh, featherweight champion in MLW. I really do too. So it's good to see that that push is happening and we're going to definitely see a lot more out of Willow Nightingale in the weeks to come. Uh, speed about people in MLW. Uh, this is uh, the news that was dropped. We mentioned it on the show before. Will Osprey is going to be making his MLW debut and it's going to happen in December. So they're looking at a December debut for Will Osprey in an MLW ring. Not sure in what aspect or who he's going to be taking on at this time, but that is the news that we have so far. I mean, this is big news for anybody who's a big fan of Will Ospreay. I've seen lots of Will Ospreay matches, some good, some, you know, it depends on the opponent and stuff like that too. But I think MLW could be the right atmosphere with the right opponents here for Will Ospreay. Looking forward to seeing where they'll go with it. And you know what? He's not the only one that's joining. I mean, they've got a whole slew of new people that they've signed that we haven't seen the debuts of yet. Uh, there's news dropped that Homicide is coming to the War Chamber. They've signed him. And also, this one's going to be one of the most fun, but the realest man in the room, Enzo Amore, Papa Smokes, he's coming to MLW. Now, I got a lot of eye rolling when I was on Sunday Brunch for Love Wrestling this week when I brought up Enzo Amore could join an MLW. But I'll say it again, just like I did on there. The guy is a well-known individual from his run in WWE. He is stellar on a microphone and can get under people's skin quite easily he's going to put eyes on the mlw product and say what you will about his in-ring work the reason i think that most people are pissy towards his in-ring work is because he's not doing a hundred thousand acrobatic moves and a bunch of false finishes or anything like that he's kind of a straightforward dude in the ring he's nothing flashy nothing fancy it's a pretty standard wrestling but he's got a character and a gimmick that backs it up and man can he talk yeah and he's the perfect kind of uh chicken shit heel so to speak as people like to call them it's not in his in his persona to get up on the top and do shooting star presses and do all kinds of flips and acrobatics and stuff like that it just isn't he's the kind of guy that uh gets in the ring Wants to win the match, but he's going to do it in a defensive manner because he's he's a coward, right? And that's the way it goes. You remember in the, the big company when he had the cruiserweight title for a while, amongst a roster of all these guys that can do all this stuff, and, and it was Amore that was holding the belt for so long. No one could believe it, but it was hilarious, and it made the, made the chase so better for the Callistos and the whoever else were chasing him for the belt all that time that we know that all these baby faces are better wrestlers than him, but try and take that belt off him. He's just not having it. I think uh, Enzo is a good character to bring into MLW. Like you say, an awesome talker. He will have the crowd eating out of the palm of his hand when he's on the mic. His ring work is whatever, but he, I think it's sufficient to what his character suggests. And, uh, I'm I'm very curious to see what they'll do with him. There there's a few people that spring to mind that might be nice opponents for him, but uh, yeah, it, it's a it's a wild card. We'll have to see what uh, Court Bauer and and Cesar Duran ha have for Enzo Amore. Yeah, well, bada boom. Hopefully, it'll be the most consensual penis in the room when he shows up in MLW. <laughs> Moving on from there. <laughs> so anyway, we had uh, backstage a curl Kwan taking a dive out of nowhere, trying to take out Alexander Hammerstone, but he is absolutely caught midair by the judge EJ Nduka, who then tosses a curl Kwan over like he's some sort of ragdoll. 
gives him a few kicks, and then him and Hammer buddy up. Hammer asks Anuka to be on his team for the War Chamber, and Anuka doesn't resist that opportunity. I mean, I think I saw this one coming a little bit when they said Hammer had to find guys. We know that Richard Holiday is the obvious fit to go alongside Hammer. Um, I think EJ and Duca, with the way they're pushing him and what they want to do with him, it was a no-brainer to have him get in there. It seemed like he was ready to start taking on Contra as well, too. So, uh, perfect fitting, nice little segment. It worked. I'm still curious to see, is Hammerstone going to be able to compete in the chamber? Because my understanding was an eight-week recovery from Fightland, which was at the beginning of October. War Chamber Films in November here, Papa Smokes. Will Hammerstone be ready to be able to go in there? I know he's got a lot of muscle to back him up, but man, Contra is one hell of a unit to be taken on, especially when you're hobbling on one leg. And they said that he has a hairline fracture of his ankle too. That that's no uh, no joke as a injury, and uh, he'll have uh, some serious healing to do and rehab to do in the meantime. Can they tape him up? Can they get him uh, secure in his boots so that it's not going to injure him f- further? We don't know this yet, and and how about Contra unit? Knowing that that ankle and foot are compromised, will they just go after that like mad dogs throughout the whole match? And that could be disastrous for Hammerstone and his his, uh, heavyweight title reign. So yeah, more question marks about that, and Hammer will need a a third partner for his four-man team. I don't think we know who that's going to be yet either, so... uh, I love this pairing of Hammerstone and Enduka, though. I mean, just look at those two guys standing next to each other, and you just have to say, how could they possibly be beaten? Just these two Greek gods of men, uh, gigantic muscle guys, and uh, it's looking good for them uh, for towards War Chamber. It really is. Uh, hopefully they can make it there in one piece. Uh, up next, we had a promo from Davey Richard talking about Tom Lawler again. You know, just like I said with the Tom Waller one from earlier, Davey Richards making his point, making really strong points. Looking forward to this one. Uh, This is going to be a solid matchup. Davey Richards, again, there's no flash about his promos. There's nothing, you know, unique about him character-wise. He's just a fucking good wrestler, and he talks like a good wrestler. That's exactly what I want out of a guy like Davey Richards, and probably why I've loved this progressive push that we're getting out of him since joining MLW. Yeah, and Davey Richards is kind of like the meat and potatoes of professional wrestlers. There's there's nothing fancy about him whatsoever. He has no gimmick. He has no bells and whistles around his character, no costumes, no anything like that. He's just straight ahead dude. Studied jiu-jitsu for a long time. Studied professional wrestling for a long time. Has had a great career in, in various companies as a tag team wrestler and as a single but he's just one of those guys. I'm I'm the best at what I do, and I'll I'll train and outwork my opponents every single time, as much as I can. Nice guy, humble, hardworking dude. I mean, that's that's like the dusty roads of his era, kind of just the working man's hero. It's again, he doesn't need shades or or pink leather pants or anything like that. He just comes out and does his stuff. I think there's a, a whole lot of fans that appreciate that kind of thing out of a pro wrestler. Yeah, and he doesn't need the Daisy Duke cutoffs either. But we'll find out how he does against those in the main event. Uh, before we get to that main event, though, Cesar Duran came out to, uh, or well, it came out, we went backstage to find out that he says he will not confirm nor deny the scandal allegations against him. But more on that will unfold in the next episode. So let's get right to that main event. Tom Lawler versus Davey Richards. This is the 2021 Opera Cup. Uh, for anybody who's tuning into our show for the first time or hasn't seen MLW, the Opera Cup, Again, was a cup that was presented in uh, opera houses back in the day and uh, wrestling, I believe, was it 1939, the last time that the Opera Cup was officially won, and that was by the legendary Stu Hart. Uh, it was brought back to MLW when uh, Davy Boy Smith Jr. had found that in the old Hart family, and it's been nice and restored. I believe this is the third uh, incarnation of the MLW's version of the Opera Cup now, Pop Smokes. And yeah. what a lineup we've got. And, man, this this opening match, uh, Tom Lawler versus Davey Richards. Now, we were a little critical about a couple of the spots with Tom Lawler recently against Alexander Hammerstone. We said maybe he was being played safe because they had the big match coming up with Hammer and Fought 2. Uh, we also questioned about whether it was a little slick in the arena that night. Uh, seemed like a couple of spots had been uh, slipped on a little bit. This was not that at all. In fact, it was quite the opposite of that. This was... 
exactly what I expected it to be. Two solid wrestling guys, two mat grapplers, two hold makers that were going to go back and forth, taking those submissions to each other. And man, did they take it to each other. This was a great wrestling match from start to finish. The ending was fantastic. I even liked the way it all went down with Tom flipping the bird, passing out. This, to me, was a piece of gold for a main event. I like this one quite a lot. I got to agree with you there. Um, uh, when this match first started, I, I was kind of noticing that the crowd didn't seem to be into it too much, but that changed over the course of this match, too. They started out nice and slow, lockups, mat grappling, uh, all kinds of holds, trading of uh, holds and reversals. I like that stuff, personally. I like it when a match will start with some wrestling. We get to see the skill of each guy. Sometimes you don't even know if one or the other of the wrestler is a good uh, mat wrestler, but then when a match starts like that, they get to show off a little bit. They get to see their skill. Both of these guys, obviously, obviously well, well trained grapplers on the mat. Um, there was some stuff that went to the outside. There was a nice... Uh, guillotine choke by uh, Lawler, which while Richards was in the hold, grabbed grabbed Lawler's ankle and applied an ankle lock. That was kind of neat. Two submission holds on at the same time. Uh, Richards hit Lawler with everything he had for a while there and was only getting two counts. Hit him with the double stomp uh, off the top. That couldn't finish him off. But then we all know that Davy Richards likes to use that ankle lock, the similar ankle lock that, that Kurt Angle uh, used as his bread and butter. And uh, eventually, as he said, the nice finish took a while for uh, Lawler to actually uh, succumb to this hold, but he tried everything to get to the ropes. Uh, Richards having none of it, got him right in the middle, sunk in the hold, and... Uh, Lawler, without the tap, just basically passed out. And uh, about a 13-minute match, which was nice. Didn't need 20 minutes, didn't need 15 minutes. But a 12- or 13-minute match here as a as an opening round Opera Cup match. Yeah, quite sufficient, I thought. They, they all did lots of stuff. It was a back-and-forth match. The uh, momentum went both ways. And then we got to see a nice submission, or uh, I should say a pass-out finished at the end there. And Davey Richards moves on to round two of the Opera Cup. So now that uh, we've talked about Davey Richards winning, I want to talk about a little bit of the elephant in the room before we talk about what happened right at the end of this episode. Now, I had to look into this because we've seen mm -hmm. them come back to this MLW thing. Tom Lawler was ranked, what, number two on the PWI rankings all throughout the uh, reopen of MLW and stuff like that. This guy's been heavily featured as one of the top MLW guys, but... We've seen him coming up short as of late, and I wondered a little bit about this because I know that he's been applying his craft over in New Japan Pro Wrestling, uh, going all over the world right now. So I found out that his contract is coming up with MLW, and it looks like he is not re-signing his contract with them. It's not a, you know, a personal vendetta against them. He doesn't hate the company, but it looks like that is what he's doing. He's putting guys over on his way out of MLW. And he's going to go and continue to apply his craft in New Japan Pro Wrestling and around the world. Uh, all I got to say is uh, thank you for what you've given to MLW there, Filthy Tom. And I will continue to seek out your matches elsewhere because you've done excellent work. So uh, anything to add on that note? Oh, so, so. No, it, it's disappointing if that's true. But I also noticed that he had another MMA fight recently. Not with the UFC that he used to be with, that he's now critical of, but with another um, federation of MMA fighters, and, and he lost his fight. But the fact that he still uh, wants to train and, and get into a cage for a, for a, a real MMA fight shows that his, his mind is elsewhere to a certain extent too, and maybe he wants to continue, uh, continue uh, MMA fighting while he still can. But uh, I'll be sorry to see him go if he leaves MLW. Certainly so. Uh, so continue on with the last bit. So that was the main event of the show, but this wasn't the end of MLW Fusion Alpha episode episode four, surprisingly. So uh, backstage, we go back to Cesar Duran's office. Richard Holiday walks in, who then refers to him as uh, Caesar Duran. And then when he's corrected, uh, he starts calling him Cesar 
Cesar Duran. Yeah. <laughs> this was quite, this was very in character for Richard Holiday and quite comical. I enjoyed it. Uh, you could tell the frustration that was growing on the face of Cesar Duran. Um, he then starts talking about uh, the expose that Alicia too had done and, apply, and implying that that is Richard Holiday's girlfriend and that she shouldn't have done that. As a result, he says that Holiday should be a defending champion of the Caribbean Championship, and he is officially making a match for next episode of MLW Fusion Alpha, where he will defend the Caribbean Championship against King Muertes. This is going to be huge, Bob Smokes. Yeah, and can't you just see setup written all over this? Uh, uh, I don't think Duran appreciated Holiday's. Uh, demeanor towards him which was uh you know holiday looks down his nose at almost everybody and he did that to duran too duran ain't gonna like that and uh i i worry for holiday's uh, safety in this match next week against king muertes because i i sense a setup you really do yeah and just when you think this was the end of the episode all of a sudden there was breaking news outside in the parking lot well, this, uh, I, I believe this is the same camera guy that went and followed 5150 when they were going for a little of the uh, Dr. Smoke's uh, little medication there. But uh, it seems like they've got a cameraman by name now. I didn't quite catch his name. I apologize for that. But he uh, got some exclusive footage of Injustice back in the parking lot talking about 5150 and their victory that they pulled on Injustice. And before you know it, all of a sudden, 5150 come rolling up in what looks to be a uh, soccer mom rental car, and they all jump out, but they beat the living shit out of Injustice. I, I love the segment. I think the car maybe should have stayed out of the picture a little bit. It didn't seem very fitting character-wise for them. But otherwise, that split in hairs, Papa Smokes, I thought the segment was good to continue on this uh, this battle and pushing 5150 as the more aggressive, strong uh, team in MLW. Yeah, absolutely. 5150 uh, heard their names getting slagged out there in the parking garage and they were just not having it. And and plus, they're the new faces on the tag team scene in MLW, so they want to make an impact. And Injustice is the logical team for them to start out against. So, you know, why even keep it in the ring? They, they already, uh, LAX already beat Injustice in the ring last episode, but here the assault continues and... Uh, they laid the boots to Myron Reed and then uh, and were slamming Jordan Oliver's head into the uh, cement pillar there too, which looked pretty violent. And uh, yeah, and then it was back into the Kia or the Hi Hyundai or whatever kind of car they had and they were out of there. But uh, I, I like the booking of, of LAX. Uh, they're looking great in this and uh, I, I'm frankly excited to see what, what's to come for them. I, I, I've find it difficult to believe they would have a a heel versus heel segment for the tag team titles against lost parks but you never really know because uh, wrestling's different nowadays they have more of those uh heel versus heel matches so uh yeah we'll see but i i it looks like they're getting a strong push it looks like they'll be in the tag team title picture in no time well, everybody hates each other when they're ch chasing gold. That's what it seems like. But that was episode four. Uh, I would have to say longer than usual episode, but a very strong episode I enjoyed. Uh, moving on to episode five, MLW Fusion episode five. That uh, came uh, the week afterwards, and we start things off. Uh, this was going to be big. The Caribbean Championship up first. Uh, we got Richard Holiday taking on King Huertes. So we're going to get this one underway. Holiday's music hits, and... All of a sudden, he's a no-show. So they say that, I believe that Rich Bokini made a mention that the, it must have been some audio problems or something like that. They start playing the music again. And once again, Holiday does not appear. And I'm thinking to myself at this point, I'm like, if he's not getting his ass handed to him backstage right now, this is not in the right vein. Because even though Holiday's got a bit of arrogance about him, they've been trying to play him off like a bit of a baby face as of late. And this was starting to get boos from the crowd. And I can't imagine it would have been the proper way to go to have the crowd hating Holiday for choosing not to come out to the ring. Uh, we would find out that, uh, hey, that's what, exactly what was happening. He was having his ass handed to him backstage. Mods Kruger and Akiro Kwan beating the living piss out of Holiday there up until the point where Hammerstone come in for the save. Um, one thing I'll mention, I mean, maybe this is just the editor in me, Papa Smokes, but this what drove me crazy is a lot of these things are figured out 
and filmed prior to actual events happening. So when we see Hammerstone come in for saves like this, there is a no sell on the ankle because there is no fractured ankle at the time of doing the putting this segment together, as far as I can tell anyway. Unless Hammerstone is just that tough and he totally can walk that way on an ankle like that. I just I think that a lot of these segments were filmed beforehand to that. And it's uh it's kind of tough to get around that when it comes to editing. And that's just the editor in me picking up on shit like that. And uh, I wish I didn't sometimes, but just my thoughts. But you know, this was this was an okay way to start. Again, you're you're building sympathy for holiday. Uh, would we get to see this match after all in the end? We're gonna find out as things went on. Uh, what are your thoughts as uh, MLW Fusion Alpha Five opened up? Well, first of all, I, you have to acknowledge that the backstage area of MLW is much more dangerous than the ring, isn't it? Because there's so many attacks, so many fights in the back that the cameraman can barely keep up with it. But uh, yeah, I, I hear you about uh, the continuity about Hammerstone's injury and all that especially when they're, they've decided to make the injury part of the storyline kind of thing too. Um, they could, they probably should be making him look vulnerable at this point, maybe on a crutch or two or something like that. But, you know, what are you going to do? They're trying to build some heat for War Chamber, a four-on-four four matchup. They need to get the guys involved. So this is what we're going to do, have some guys fight in the back and uh, Holiday getting jumped by Mads Kruger and Akiro Kwan. Uh, yeah, took a lick and they, when the camera got on him, he was down. They were kicking him in the gut. They were kicking him in the head. So what uh, will this have to do with our main event tonight? Will Holiday be able to uh, compete at some point later in this show? I guess we'll have to see. Yeah, so... That match definitely uh, up in the air. We're not sure about that one, but we got right on to the next match of the evening. So it's the featherweight division. It's Nicole Savoy taking on Holodead, who uh, was there with Dr. Dax, I believe his name is, that she brought out on a chain to ringside. And as we were talking about before, the push of Willow Nightingale continues. On commentary for this one, and at first I was like, interesting choice. I was curious to see how Willow Nightingale would hold herself together during an entire portion of the show on commentary because you see it time and time again wrestlers getting on commentary it's not an easy thing to do even if they are a good speaker in terms of their ability on a microphone talking a wrestling promo it doesn't always translate the same to doing commentary and stuff willow nightingale seemed extremely comfortable here in my opinion and i think she did a great job uh, we'll get to the match in a minute but thoughts on willow on uh, commentary yeah, I agree with what you said completely because it's it's one thing to have a wrestler on commentary. They can have three, four, five, six important points that they want to make throughout one match. But if that match is 12 or 15 minutes long, that's a lot of time. And as you and I know, it's it's not always easy to fill up all that time with interesting and funny things to say. Having said that, Willow Nightingale, I thought, uh, also sounded very comfortable on commentary. She's a nice, friendly, breezy, uplifting kind of girl, and she sounds nice. Uh, she d doesn't have anything uh, mean to say about anybody, but she's also firm in that she wants to uh, establish her spot in the featherweight division. But this was a this was a nice piece, and we don't we've never really seen a guest commentators on MLW before. Not sure if they put, do the commentary live with the matches or afterwards or not, but uh, in this Philadelphia taping, she was sitting in the booth with the guys live, so very nice touch, and she did a good job. Yeah, she really did. Uh, before the match got started, though, we also got a promo from Nicole Savoy. Uh, one thing I will say, and again, this is not a big slight against Nicole Savoy because I think her ring ring work is great. Her promo needs a little bit more oomph. It was there. She can talk. It needs to feel a little bit more like she means it kind of thing. I, I think it's just a couple of steps back where she needs to push herself to make it sound more like she's about to just go in there and mop the floor with her opponent. Uh, it seemed a little too friendly, I guess. Uh, and with Willow Nightingale, the friendliness works. With Nicole Savoy... Because she's kind of a submission specialist and a mat wrestler and stuff like that, I wanted to hear a little bit more of that ass kicker in her and stuff like that. And I think that will come. It'll come with experience. Um, before we talk about the match itself, your thoughts on her promo? 
Yeah, I basically I agree with you too. Um, she sounded a little too laid back, and uh, I want to hear some more fire from her. But maybe she needs a, a storyline to be developed. Maybe she needs a feud, an enemy, etc., in order to get that fire going within her. I, I think it'll come along also. Well, maybe call it a happy accident, but but at the end of this match, it almost seems like she will have something to play off of. Uh, so the match itself, I enjoyed this one. Uh, obviously, Holodead, she's got a great look. We know that she can work really well. Uh, she, you know, the, she's been tag team with Thunder Rosa for years. Dr. Dax on the outside, interesting individual. I wonder where that's going to lead to yeah. and if we're going to see him involved in an MLW ring as well too or if he's just going to be down at the side of Holodead. But Holodead, very much the aggressor in this match. But Nicole Savoy, a great submission specialist, uh, especially being that I believe when I checked, it's only been a couple of years that she's been involved in the business. So considering her very small amount of time in the business, I'd say she's picking up some things really well. I think that there will be great development from her, and I can see why there is this push to have her towards the top. It is a shame that she did pick up an injury in here, and much like Hammerstone, be up to about eight weeks or so that I hear that she could be out for. Uh, but again, this could be exactly what she needs. Getting injured by somebody that's aggressive like Holodead in this first matchup. Yeah, she won, but Holodead still walked away on her own two feet. There, there's a story to be told there when Nicole Savoy comes back, in my opinion. Yeah, and it was kind of weird. I had to rewind this, the finish of this match and watch again because... It appears that Savoy's injury occurred during the finish when she was delivering that last uh, suplex and uh, arm submission. She had a she had a some kind of a triangle arm lock on uh, Holiday. Holiday gave gave the verbal submission, not the tap out. But uh, as Holiday uh, rolled out of the ring and stuff, we could see that Savoy was not getting up in some distress and then they had the doctor and the extra referees come out checking on her and she didn't look too good she you could see that fear in her eyes of what's wrong with me they tried to get her up one time and she was like no i can't stand up so I, i'm not exactly sure what happened i watched it twice but uh something folded on her and and she didn't uh feel comfortable standing up or getting up so we had that kind of uncomfortable moment on wrestling when uh, you have to leave the the camera has to leave the rings ring area and we still don't have her on her feet yet so uh, all the best out to nicole savoy i, I hope she uh, isn't hurt too too badly i hope she can come back this is kind of a setback on your first match in the new company in the new featherweight division but this isn't ballet and, and stuff happens uh, during every match. So, uh, uh, yeah, just all the best to her and have a quick comeback. I think sympathy will be uh, on the side of Savoy when she does come back from this injury. Uh, the nice thing is it looks makes Holodead seem like more of a badass than she already did. And then we would get to see more of that on display shortly afterwards because Willow Nightingale would cross paths with Holodead on the way out. And man, did Holodead give a beat down to Willow Nightingale. And again, building sympathy for their push of a baby face in Willow Nightingale. She takes a DDT to the apron. She's laid out flat by Holodead. Holodead looks completely like the monster heel that she should in this division. And that, I believe, is the direction they're going to go. Holodead is going to be their number one heel in this division for now, especially. And Willow Nightingale, clearly, especially now with Nicole Savoy on the sidelines for a while, is clearly going to be the top baby face. I could clearly see this being a matchup that could lead to... I mean, I do know that they've got the match signed and coming up soon enough, but I believe that down the road, this is going to be what we might see when it comes down to crowning the first featherweight champion in MLW. And how perfect for Hola did to come back with two, and yet to, she can say in the future, yeah, you may have gotten the... the the win just barely in our first match, but I was the one that walked out and I left you laying there. It, it just, it builds upon a, a feud that could have uh, legs in the, in the months to come. It really did. So this was a great segment. Loved it. Great job by MLW and the featherweight division. Uh, the women continuing to show what they're made of. Um, up next, we're backstage. Uh, Richard Holiday gives an update saying that even though the doctor says he's not clear to fight, he says he's clear to fight. So, as far as we're concerned, the main event now is back on, and Richard Holiday will be defending the Caribbean Championship against King Muertes, after all. 
Uh, right after that, we went back to in-ring action. So a lot of in-ring action on this episode of MLW Fusion Pop Smokes. We're back to the Opera Cup, round one. Matt Cross tanking on Calvin Tankman. It's been a guest song commentary, King Mo on commentary for this one. And I uh, got to say, King Mo, maybe not, uh, not as collected as uh, Willow Nightingale on the uh, commentary team, but he made his points perfectly uh Right in this case, he says he's scoping out Tankman, but as Tankman is getting the match taken to him off the start here by Matt Cross, Mo says, hey, maybe I'm not here just for Tankman. Maybe I'm checking out Matt Cross at the same time, and if Matt Cross continues to throw hits at Tankman like he is here today, maybe that's who I need to be talking to instead of Calvin Tankman. Great from King Mo. Uh, the match itself, I thought, was good. I mean, I, I maybe was a little bit critical of Matt Cross versus Jacob Fatu, again, because the... The, the clear putting it on the night before the fight land matchup kind of took away from the aura of will Matt cross upset Fatu, even though I think at the back of our mind, we would have known anyway, this was different. I uh, definitely so. And I think we got to see Matt cross uh, better displayed in this here matchup. And again, uh, Tankman uh, getting an opportunity to fight another very experienced wrestler, putting on a nice experienced matchup. And again, the aggression coming out in Tankman uh, in this one, uh, he gets that victory, and even after so, he's still being very aggressive in the words that he's using and stuff like that. And then this is leading to Matt Cross now claiming that Tankman's a cheater. He said that this is not like Calvin Tankman, claiming that he poked him in the eye to take the victory here. Uh, thoughts on the matchup and on Matt Cross's uh, belief in what Tankman did to win this one? Yeah, I, I thought this was a pretty all right match. Uh Cross started out quickly in this one, uh, being the smaller and quicker and more agile of the two men. Although just barely, Tankman's pretty agile as well. But uh, Cross was trying to use speed, trying to use aerial uh, tactics and some strikes, but just couldn't get over Tankman's power and bulk. I mean, they backed up uh, each other to do the trading forearms a couple times and... Uh, and Cross would hit Tankman, and then Tankman would hit Cross, and then that exchange was over. Cross would be back in the corner, sore, dazed, groggy. And I like the way this was laid out, that, that the littler guy probably shouldn't and can't hang with the big, strong guy in, in an exchange like that. In, in lots of other companies, we see them just do those exchanges, sometimes 10 times in a match, where it's just completely unbelievable that they would do that, and that each wrestler would invite the other guy to have free free punches at his face. Like, I mean, the, I don't like this spot in the first place, but at least it was in this case it was used uh, fairly realistically. Um, there were a few other things I liked on that. Uh, Tankman powerbombed Cross onto the apron when they were outside. That slowed down the speedster quite a lot as such also a, such a dangerous spot uh, doing stuff on the apron. It makes me cringe every time, but then it's become pretty commonplace now too. Uh, and then eventually, yeah, as you mentioned, uh, uh, Tankman getting the pinfall with the, uh, gave him the spinning, the standing spinning elbow. And then when they were down on the mat, another power back elbow to the back of the head. That's a crushing blow to anybody. Pinfall, one, two, three. Calvin Tankman advances past the first round of the Opera Cup to the second round. And then, yeah, the scene, that, that alleged thumb to the eye happened right at the end of that match, right before those two spinning elbows. You saw Cross going to the referee and pointing to his eye and pointing to Tankman, trying to get some, uh, some form of uh, justice out of this from the referee but i don't think the referee saw anything i'm not sure there was anything i didn't see this thumb to the eye either but cross was sure playing it up so what do we have developing here munson is uh is is matt cross going to turn into a heel uh, with all his complaining here he very well could again we they're still kind of toeing the line the tankman might go the same direction uh joining with king mo and alex kane and as i was mentioning before with Kane being named as a standby, there's got to be something in place here where Kane has intent to find his way into this Opera Cup one way or another. Uh, how that's going to unfold, we don't know yet. But again, they are teasing the ideas here. I'm curious to see where it all goes. There seems to be a lot more fleshed out kind of story to what's going on in the Opera Cup. A lot more highlighted here. Uh, definitely curious to see where it all goes. Uh, we still got some... 
opening round matchups to come in the coming weeks as well, too. Some great competitors that are taking place in this Opera Cup. But yeah, great, uh, great thing for DeCalvin Tangman to make it to the next round and allowing Matt Cross to continue to have something going for him moving forward as well, too. So I think uh, it'd be interesting to see where Matt Cross takes this complaint uh, going into next week's episode. But Pop Smokes, now to our favorite part of this entire episode of Ring Respect Radio. I just about dropped my beer on the floor when I saw this segment come up on TV. But fucking heavy got to have a promo on MLW TV. It doesn't get much better than that. And as Bud put it, that pop he got in Philly was almost as awesome as when he drank his first beer. I got to say, CNR Bud, Bud Heavy on MLW television in a backstage promo was almost as awesome as the beer that was in my hand at that point. How about you? And so immediately soon after we had him on Ring Respect Radio, too. What do you think, Bunsen? Is that a coincidence? I don't really think so. I think Bud's hitting the big time, and I think we're helping him there. I sure hope so. Maybe uh, Corp Bauer's been checking out Ring Respect Radio a little bit and understands the uh, popularity of uh, at least of Bud Heavy anyway. I don't know about the two of us, but, uh, you know, maybe this is just a, a stepping stone. He gets Bud Heavy in there and inevitably, hey, Bud, get 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 our foot in the door. You know, they could use some more commentary guys, some guys who know how to talk shit. You know, maybe you need a couple of ringside boys to help you out, you know, a ring crew or something like that. You know, boxers have them. Bud Heavy needs it, too. Give us a call, man. You know where we're at. But I, I loved it. It was great. I mean, I couldn't say how awesome this was uh, because we had him on the show. And then a week later, literally, and this comes out. I was sitting there watching this with my wife. And even she goes, hey, isn't that that guy that you just interviewed on your show? She's like, that's him. And I'm like, yes, dear. That That is him. I was like, that's our bud. Bud Heavy right there. Drinking a beer and having fun. Man, he looked great on there. Good old, good old fashioned time. Man, Bud Heavy is just, just fun i mean he's a great dude well and the other thing is too that that as we talked about with bud heavy we're interested in enhancement talent because it is extremely important to every wrestling show but that's the other thing about being a job guy is that you can be a job guy for a while but eventually if you get over and you get over with the fans you might just get a little spot as a featured guy and maybe that's what's happening with Bud Heavy right now. And I really hope it is because he's such a good guy and such a hard worker and all that. But that just goes to show you, keep your nose to the grindstone. Keep working hard. Keep being a good guy and a good um, co-worker and co-wrestler in the back. And maybe you might get your opportunity. Maybe he just had a short spot with Alicia on this show in which he was interrupted uh, by Caesar Duran's henchmen and all that. But, hey, everybody's got to start somewhere. He never had an on-camera spot before, and he's got one now. Good for Bud Heavy. Go for it, man. And I, I hope he gets featured a little bit better and a little more in the in the weeks and months to come. Yeah, we better get him back on uh, Ring Respect Radio right away before he becomes too big for a little show like ours. Yeah. Uh, anyway, Bud Heavy, congratulations, man, from uh, the both of us. We're happy to see it's uh, working out for you, dude. Uh, from there, though, yeah, you mentioned about the uh, promo getting cut off a little bit early by Cesar Duran's uh, henchman there. Uh, so that led us into the next segment in his office. Cesar Duran's office, Alicia Two is brought in, who he refers to as Alicia Tout, which she uh, firmly corrects him. It seems to be the ongoing thing in Cesar Duran's office about uh, getting people called by their wrong name there. Uh, they talk about journalism. Alicia wants to be able to do an interview with him. Uh, he talks about the expose that she brought out and stuff like that and about how, you know, her relationship with Richard Holiday and everything like that. And the plan is he's going to make her watch the matchup tonight. He wants her out there to watch what King Muertes has in store for Richard Holiday. Yeah, yeah. So isn't this interesting? I think he he plans on hurting Richard Holiday through Alicia too. I'm not sure if uh, if we have any uh, any confirmation on to whether they're actually a, a romantic item or anything like that. I know Caesar thinks they are, but uh, it's very interesting, and uh, he, he's really flexing his power around MLW. I wanted to just backtrack to one little uh, segment that we missed there, too, that nope. was the backstage camera catching Joseph Samuel and, and Jacob Fatu. Yes, shit, sorry, man. No, it's yeah. okay, yelling in the background, yelling in the back of the arena uh, backstage area. And this was very telling, too, because uh, uh, Fatu was frustrated, yelling about Hammerstone and, and 
screaming about his rage that he lost this match, but what Samael was repeatedly saying was, get your head back in the game and get ready for War Chamber. And it was a little bit of a pep talk by uh, by Samael, a, a tough love pep talk, getting right in Fatu's face and saying, you're our warrior and you're our machine and you're our killer. We need you for War Chamber. And it, he talked Fatu back into it. By, by the end of their short chat there, Fatu was back to hail Contra and all the rest of it. I, I think that was an important little bit that uh, the cameraman happened to see in the background. We get to see uh, everything apparently fine with Contra Unit too, and uh, Fatu on the same page. I know there had been some speculation about whether he might stay with MLW or whether he might stay with Contra Unit. Well, we're kind of getting confirmation that he probably is for the near future at least, and that, that makes me feel good. Yeah, and I'm glad you went back and brought that up because I definitely forgot it in my notes here, Paul. Smokes, and that would have been a shame not to mention it. Uh, great segment, as always. Uh, goes without saying, uh, Joseph Samael, Fat Two, great when they're doing conversations, and that pep talk was excellent. And again, bringing up the idea that there seems to be this roaming cameraman that has now become kind of active with the show. He's getting in there mysteriously behind the scenes, capturing this footage that normally wouldn't get caught. I like how that's unfolding. I think it's a nice touch to the MLW uh, program, and I, I like what they're doing with it. And uh, mad props to the uh, other video bro out there that's uh, getting his getting his just dues in uh, MLW right there. Yeah, maybe we can get a spot with him, Munson. We can be his uh, roving cameraman. I, I'm down anytime. I mean, I my phone's always on. It's always on, so give us a shout. Uh, so now we get to our main event of the evening. This is the Caribbean Championship match. King Muertes versus Richard Holiday. Uh, would Richard Holiday have it in him to be able to survive the menace of King Muertes? I mean, you would think on any given day, King Muertes should be able to really take the fight to Richard Holiday and this be a very equal matchup in every sense of the word. But again, with Holiday having uh, taken the beat down at the beginning of the show, you've got to imagine favor on the side of King Muertes. Alicia Tude at ringside with Cesar Duran. He's got uh, his bodyguards there. He's moved some of the uh, fans from ringside. They're pouring champagne and watching this match up there. Um, this is, I, I made a note here where I said it, the, the match itself is good. There is no, the match ended up be, probably being better than I expected it to be considering Holiday's injury. But this is another example of where maybe the segment itself exceeded the match itself kind of thing the the unfolding story that they're playing on here i think was even more intriguing than the full match itself and i'm not being negative about this i liked it i thought it was well played out it was a good idea um again is as arrogant and cocky as holiday's been he's kind of been towing that line of becoming a baby face and i think this more so than ever uh solidifies him in that baby face that sympathetic type way uh, i thought it was the match, it rolled out nicely. King Muertes is a beast. I love this guy. I love his look. Yeah. I love his entrance. I love the match that they were putting on. And even when Holiday put Muertes up into that torture rack and spun him around for that spinning ne neck breaker, I thought, holy shit, Richard Holiday is going to walk away with this thing. And he didn't quite get it. Um, in the end, yes, it took some interference and a little bit of beat down. But uh, Richard Holiday coming up short. And we have a new Caribbean champion in King Muertes. Uh, during the matchup, too, we went to a picture-in-picture -picture backstage. There's a fight breaking out. Hammer and Duca and the members of Contra all battling backstage. There, there was a lot to unpackage in this main event uh, here between promo, storyline, the match itself. I mean, you, you would normally think this might be a little bit of a clusterfuck, but I think they pulled it together nicely in a way that didn't turn it into one, and it ended up being a really good uh, segment that paid off very well. Sure, that, that's a good way to put it. I agree with that, that it was uh, a match, but with a larger segment all around it, too. And uh, it was kind of neat to have uh, the storyline being developed uh, in front of the live crowd. And you could uh, the fact that you could see Duran and Atu from the hard cam sitting on the opposite side of the ring amongst the fans and everything, uh, it, it kind of uh, looked neat that way. Um I thought this was one of the better Mil Muertes matches we've seen. Uh, he he's There's nothing fancy about his style. He's a brawler all the way. It's a lot of kicks, a lot of punches, a lot of heavy body slams, and uh, 
not really anything more fancy than that, but it's it's not needed when you're a three hundred pound, six foot two Mexican guy with a mask. Like he he's he's terrifying in his character, and you see him dripping that blood out of his mouth yeah. into the skull at the beginning. It looks like some heavy metal concert from the eighties or something. Really quite excellent. Um, Muerte's controlled a whole ton of this match uh, as we had Holiday set up with the injury and the sympathy angle. Um, even there was one point where uh, Muerte's had Holiday down on the mat and Holiday was trying to do the timeout and bagging off and stuff like that. I thought, I thought Holiday was trying to lure Muerte's into something, but no, no, he he was just on the ropes real bad at that point in the match and. Just begging off from this from this monster Muertes. Anyway, th- this was good stuff. I also really really liked the spot uh, that you mentioned when uh, Holiday took Muertes off the top rope in that torture rack, gave him the neck buster. I thought that might have been the finish, but it was a very close two count. And then, as we saw, as you mentioned, uh, uh, Ikiro Kwan comes out uh, with a couple of members of the Sente Death Squad and. Uh, he delivers the spin kick to Holiday outside the ring. Muertes hits that straight to hell face buster on the concrete floor, throws him back in the ring. Pinfall. There you go. New Caribbean champion, uh, King Muertes. Pretty decent match. Uh, pushed the storyline storyline along. Got Holiday looking a little more baby faceish. Uh, had a title change. Uh, had the uh, Contra unit attacking uh, Hammer and his boys in the back. I mean, this was a loaded match and a loaded segment, but I think it all came off pretty well. It was pretty busy to watch. You, you had your mind on a few things as well as the match, but I don't think it was overdone. They packed a lot of content into this. Uh, this was around a, an 11 or 12 minute match as well, and uh, I, I think well done by MLW. Uh, now, I'm not sure if we're going to go forward with the Caribbean Championship as being something that King Muertes is going to have multiple defenses of on TV or if that will kind of fade off into the background. But I don't think Holiday needs that belt at this time. It was a, it was a good um, adornment for his character for a time there and, and was giving him some good heel heat and putting down the Caribbean people and... Uh, and uh, uh, what's his name there uh, that he had the strap match with uh, Savio Vega Savio Vega got some good heat off of that but uh, yeah I don't I don't think Holiday needs that belt if he's going to be a baby face and uh, he'll just be ready to join uh, Hammerstone's team for War Chamber yeah and I'm very much looking forward to that I also enjoyed uh, watching Alicia to- uh, to- sorry, pour the champagne on Cesar Duran's head at the end and walking off I mean she's showing a lot of uh, a lot of, uh, you know, I, I, I want to say <laughs> she's showing uh, some mighty big uh, balls there to dump that on the boss's head. Like, so uh, he seems like he was already kind of PO'd at her and uh, she goes and pulls that off. So kind of curious to see how that all unfolds for Alicia Toot in the uh, coming weeks as well, too. Uh, she was just the backstage interview queen and now she has a little bit more to unfold as this uh, storyline continues to unfold. So overall, I got to say these two episodes, MLW Fusion Alpha, definitely kept my interest. I liked them from top to bottom. Solid matches, good builds, a lot of new faces being introduced and a lot of great things going on there. And it's nice to see it all in front of a crowd. It was one thing for us to be able to watch these things when they had no audience there and review them and stuff like that. But with an audience there, it really does make a hell of a lot of difference there, Pop Smokes. I'm really enjoying uh, what MLW is throwing down, as always, as I'm sure you are as well, too. Uh, Anything else to add to this episode? No, I I think the same thing as you. They're going along at a nice pace. They've got some new faces. They've got some new concepts. And they're doing some new things with some of the old faces as well. So, I mean, uh, it's a lot of stuff for each episode. But they managed to pace it pretty good through there. And I I think uh, the booking and the laying out of the matches continues to be good. Uh, you know me, Munson. I much prefer live wrestling to wrestling on TV. But if I'm going to watch a, a, a wrestling show on TV, I still like MLW better than all the other uh, options that we have out there. So uh, I, I like their sports-based presentation. It has some 
fun and some silliness in the background as well as professional wrestling always does, but not too much. It's used nicely here and there. And uh, this is a good product, and uh, I, I like MLW, and I'm constantly excited to see what's coming up on the next uh, episodes. Yeah, and we got a lot of great things that are going to unfold in the coming weeks. Looking forward to being able to review those and recap those with you guys here on Ring Respect Radio. But uh, that's going to wrap it up for this episode of the show here today. If you haven't done so already, remember to click that subscribe button down below. Go check out MLW Fusion Alpha episodes up on YouTube, and you can also now catch both of the matches from MLW Fightland up on YouTube as well, too. So you can check out the Fatu versus Hammerstone match and also the uh, four-way matchup for the MLW uh, Middleweight Championship as well, which are now available. And continue to just check them out on social media. There's a lot of news floating around about plans that they have and uh, crossovers that they're going to do, uh, especially coming up with all Japan Pro Wrestling and stuff, too. So a lot of great things coming out of MLW. So we will continue to recap and review those here on our show. We will continue to try to bring in people such as Bud Heavy as special guests here and help those enhancement talents as they also help us continue to rise our views as well too. Thank you once again, everybody, for tuning in to our show, and we look forward to seeing you again very soon. Take care. When you go to the old saloon at the Dead South End, gonna find Don't go